Howdy, folks. <laughs> I'm Larry Nelson, and I'm the MC on this here program. I'd like to introduce you to the two fellows that you just heard playing. They're two-thirds of a group that's called, they call themselves the Hereford Heart Stringers. And this is Phil Richardson playing banjo so splendidly. And this is Uber Beggar B that you'll be hearing more from later playing guitar. And uh, I'd like now to tell you a few words about country fiddle music. I'm kind of a newcomer to country fiddle music myself and don't know a great deal about it, but I'll tell you what I can. Um, to begin with, the country fiddle is quite a lot different than the regular instrument that we refer to as a violin. People often ask me what the differences are, and uh, quite simply, there are a few. This is a violin. It's not a fiddle, but the fiddles that were in use in the early days were often handmade by people who lived in Arkansas, Kentucky, Tennessee, in the mountains, the hill country, the Ozarks. And these interesting instruments were made out of all kinds of things. They were made out of tabletops. They were made out of old chests of drawers. They were made out of bedsteads that came across the country with the settlers. They were made out of old wagon wheels sometimes. Instruments were made out of hoes, not violins, but some instruments were made out of hoes, rakes, and other kinds of farm implements. But the fiddles themselves characteristically had a shorter neck than the contemporary violin does. Pegs were often loose and sometimes slipped, and as a result, we had detuned instruments sometimes, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. The uh, bridge of the old country fiddle was sometimes shaved off a little bit flatter because it was a custom for country fiddlers to play on several strings at once, at least two, sometimes three. And it made it a lot easier if the bridge wasn't quite as curved and arched as the regular violin bridge is. Uh, Good fiddle, and around 1910 could be had from the Sears catalog for anywhere from about 12.95 up to their super deluxe imported model, it ran about $35. Now, for the people in the country who were rich enough to afford this uh, type of violin, they were able to uh, order one, modify it for their own use, and uh, became to be very uh, common. But a lot of instruments were just made at home and played on. Uh, a bow was also available in the Sears catalog. Uh, which was about the, as long as the bow you see here. This is rather longer than the bow that a lot of country fiddlers were used to playing on, and so as a result, when they uh, ordered the bow and they, they, they discovered that it was about six or eight inches longer than the bow that they were used to playing with, they um, gripped it here, approximately, and uh, played their instrument holding the bow a little bit closer to the tip. And a lot, there are lots of photographs of old country players playing with the bow in their hand in about this position. Um, I might mention that uh, that the thumb was sometimes extended a little bit straighter, too, and the fingers were about in that position. Now, I'd like to play a little piece for you. It's an old timer. It's an Irish piece. Originally, it was called Rosin the Bow. So you understand what it is we're talking about. Here it is. Rosin the Bow is called. It came over from Ireland. And predictably, when it hit the American shores, it was transformed into rosin the bow. And before long, it became known as Acres of Clams. And I understand for a short time, enjoyed popularity as a state so song of the state of Washington. Here's what it sounds like. Incidentally, you might be interested to know also that a lot of the country players hold their instrument down like this while they play with the bow in this position. And um, because it's comfortable to do so, they hold their left hand with their palm up like this, and the fingers uh, attack the strings from this position. And so, as a rule, they only play uh, melodies in the keys that correspond to the open strings of the violin, G, D, A, and E. Uh, this conventional tuning, by the way, was referred to by the old timers as a natural flat tuning. This violin is detuned into what was called the A minor tuning. The two lower strings are tuned to A, E, A, and E.
a pretty relaxed way to play, play the violin. I have another little number I'd like to play for you, which will illustrate something else about country fiddle playing. This tune um, is one that uh, is called Roll in My Sweet Baby's Arms. And uh, I'm going to first play just the vocal melody for you, and then I'm going to play a little bit of an elaboration of one verse. So you get some idea about uh, what some of the commonly used elaborations were in the old time. And then when I get through, I'll turn it over to Phil, and he'll demonstrate some of the things that are possible in country western music today. So this uh, old tune is referred to as Roll in My Sweet Baby's Arms. some of the common licks that are associated with country western fiddle playing, the old style. Uh, and I'd like to turn the stage over now to Phil Richardson, who will show you some of the things that he's developed and devised. And uh, these boys are all under the influences of many kinds of music today. And I would say that country western music has come a long way. Phil? Yes, I'd say we're definitely under the influence. <laughs> <laughs> this song is uh, one I wrote myself. I was inspired by a fiddle player for a group called Phantoms of the Opera, his name is Paul Selaski. This is a sort of a novelty item where you string the hair over the strings and the stick underneath, that way you can play two, two strings, three or four. Thanks a lot, Phil. Man, that was a great tune. Listen, I'd like to turn this, these proceedings back over to my friend Uva now, who's going to talk a little bit about the instrument that he's holding here. It's a guitar, and you'll be, I think, amazed to know that Uva made this guitar himself, and he's going to say a few words about it. Uva? All right. Well, the guitar, as it's uh, evolved from those old back porch hoedowns to the uh, present-day bluegrass, it's taken quite a few steps, mainly in the construction of it. As the uh, as it evolved, the body of the guitar, the basic proportions grew, got wider and fatter, and everything about it got longer. And uh, to uh, basically to make it louder, which was the the main point, was so it could be loud and heard above the other instruments. The uh, uh, during the big band era, as the uh, guitar was introduced 
on, on a jazz level too. The uh, uh, strings became uh, heavier, steel strings, they got heavier. Uh, the instrument had to compete with horns and uh, just had to be loud. So uh, those, uh, for those reasons, it had to uh, evolve into a, you know, a loud instrument. So basically, uh, just the uh, size of the, the proportion of the instrument grew. And in the same way, the banjo also had to uh, adapt for the, uh, for the same reason, to be loud and heard above the uh, horn sections. And uh, so Phil here is going to show you, tell you a little bit about the instrument and uh, how it evolved and what it is today. The type of banjo that was used in the jazz bands was a four string. There were two different kinds of four strings, a tenor banjo and a plectrum banjo. I, I play the five string. Four string banjo style sounds, you know, ragtime, say, here's an example. That progression, incidentally, is called the Sears Roebuck progression because it was used so many times. Anyhow, this is a five string banjo. It's, got, it's different than the four string and that it has a drone string higher up the neck, which sounds the whole time, whether, no matter what's being played. Uh, there's a style of picking invented by Earl Scruggs, which used use three fingers. Listen for the drone string, that's this note, never changes. the banjo, they call it ringing banjos, you can hear them a long ways away because the notes ring, the overtones. Later in the 1950s, a man named Bill Keith invented a style of more melodic playing where there weren't so many drone notes. An example might be the Battle of New Orleans where every note played is a melody note. straight, cut and dried. Uh, more recently, people have taken farther to write in more chromatic notes. I'm going to play a little song now by Jerry Reed. It's called Jerry's Breakdown. I'm just going to play an excerpt from it. Now, this is a more chromatic style, but still every note's a melody note. friend of ours, banjo player, his name's Bruce Campbell, he sort of comically named the tune Cow Pies Retreat. It's a, it was originally for banjo and fiddle, but we do it here with the version with two violins. joke that says uh, string players spend half their time tuning and half the time playing out of tune. Well, it's sort of bad under here in the lights. This is Cow Pies Retreat. <laughs> 